Well, hello again to you. We are just over halfway done with this series, and I do hope that you are enjoying it as much as I am. This episode is going to be particularly interesting because we're going to learn a bit more about the ark and also about dinosaurs. Some of this information can be found on pages 69 to 81 of the book. Now, this presentation is a little bit longer. It's also just over 30 minutes, but it is because there is so much interesting information that I want to share with you. So let's begin. Make yourself an ark of gopher wood. Make rooms in the ark and cover it inside and outside with pitch. And this is how you shall make it. The length of the ark shall be 300 cubits, its width 50 cubits, and its height 30 cubits. You shall make a window for the ark and you shall finish it to a cubit from above and set the door in the ark in its side. You shall make it with lower, second and third decks. And behold, I myself am bringing flood waters on the earth to destroy from under heaven all flesh in which is the breath of life. Everything that is on the earth shall die. God commanded Noah to build an ark so that he and his family could be safe. The ark had to be big enough to keep one pair of each kind of land animal as well as one pair of each kind of flying animal alive in the ark during the flood. God declared certain animals as clean and no, it's not because they like to take a bath. It is because they are acceptable for humans to eat while the unclean animals are not. You can read about this in Leviticus 11. Only clean animals were used in sacrifices to God, which is why God told Noah that there must be extra clean animals and why he took seven pairs of all kinds of clean animals on board as well. Now some people have this picture in their mind of an ark that looks like a massive floating wooden bath with the heads of adult giraffes and elephants and of course Noah sticking out on top while waving goodbye to no one. But this cute ark is not nearly as big as the real ark in the Bible. The Bible is quite clear about the size of the ark. In common language, the ark was 140 meters long. That is longer than a soccer field. It was 23 meters wide. That is wider than four traffic lanes and 14 meters high. That is higher than a four-story building. And it had three decks. Now, we are privileged these days to be able to see some life-size replicas of Noah's ark. Johan Habers is a Dutchman who decided to build a floating replica of Noah's Ark a few years ago. He first built a half-sized Ark, which is the one on the right, and then on the left you can see he built this full-size Ark, which took four years to complete in 2012 that was done. It has attracted thousands of visitors, a wonderful way of spreading the truth, but this is not the only replica of Noah's Ark. There is also a full-sized concrete replica right next to the road leading to one of the world's busiest airports in Hong Kong. And then there is this fantastic life-size replica of Noah's Ark which was opened in Kentucky and in 2016 by Answers in Genesis. That is definitely on my bucket list. Korean shipbuilders found the ark, as described in the Bible, to be one of the most stable forms of seafaring vehicles that are able to handle a very rough sea. According to them, the ark could withstand winds of up to three times hurricane strength and waves of up to 30 meters high and probably even higher. And it could tilt over beyond 60 degrees without toppling over. Terrible things were going on in the Earth's crust during the flood, causing earthquakes, tsunamis, volcanic eruptions, boiling fountains of water jetting out, water sloshing back and forth. It was wild. Of course, it wasn't necessary for the Ark to have a streamlined cruise ship design, because where would it cruise to anyway? Wave number 777-321498. No, everything was underwater. The ark only needed to stay afloat. It took Noah a very long time to build the ark, but 
he didn't do this all on his own. His sons also helped. It is also very likely that Noah used hired laborers to help them with this enormous task. 120 years have elapsed since the time that God issued the warning that he was going to destroy the earth with a flood until the flood began. People therefore had a 120 year period of grace during which they could repent and turn to God. During this time, Noah built the ark and he continually warned the people, repent for a flood is coming, a flood is coming, a flood is coming. All they had to do if they wanted to be saved was to believe and trust in God by getting into the ark when the time came. But no, nobody bothered to listen to the repeated warnings and instead they mocked Noah, bursting with last laughter every chance they got. <laughs> Jesus also spoke of this in the Bible. The people in Noah's time did not heed the repeated warnings and ignored it. They did not believe that a flood was really coming until they were caught off guard and they were overcome by water. In the same way, Jesus has repeatedly given us his assurance that he is coming to the earth again and this time he will come as the judge. However, just as in the time of Noah, there are people today who simply don't believe that this will happen and therefore they will also be called of God. For as in the days before the flood, they were eating and drinking, marrying and giving in marriage until the day that Noah entered the ark and did not know until the flood came took them all away. So also will the coming of the Son of Man be. Now having large animal collections were quite common among ancient civilizations. For example, Trajan was a Roman emperor and he had an animal collection which was comparable to that of Noah. The collection included domestic and wild animals. King Solomon also had many animals and even 4,000 stables just for his horses. These animal collections are called a menagerie. And of every living thing, of all flesh, you shall bring two of every sort, the New Living Translation says, kind into the ark. According to Genesis 6 verse 19 and 7 verse 2, it is clear that God told Noah to gather the animals to be taken onto the ark. Remember, Noah could have used hired help or his own servants to gather the animals, just like the emperors did centuries later. But Noah did not have to run around all day to try and catch each animal. Can you imagine how Noah, at his rather advanced age, would have struggled to catch a playful rabbit, especially if they were already wearing those long robes? The Bible says that God instructed the animals to go into the ark. So Noah did not have to chase the animals to gather them. Read with me. Of the birds after their kind, of animals after their kind, and of every creeping thing of the earth after its kind, two of every kind will come to, to you to keep them alive. And they went into the ark to Noah, two by two, of all flesh in which is the breath of life. So where was Noah at that stage? Yes, he was inside the ark. This means that God was completely in control of how the animals were selected and gathered for the ark. Noah may even have built up an animal collection in anticipation of the flood and then God supernaturally commandeered the animals into the ark. Gathering and keeping the animals beforehand would have been quite beneficial since animals in captivity are more used to people and are therefore easier to handle. Animals in zoos, for example, are much more used to humans than animals in game parks. In this way, Noah could also observe the animals carefully to identify any weak or diseased animals and replace them with healthy, strong ones. Looking at Genesis 7.22 more closely, it is clear that God did not tell Noah to take one pair of each kind of animal in existence into the ark, but only the land animals and the flying animals that breathed air through nostrils 
all in whose nostrils was the breath of the spirit of life. This would exclude insects because they don't breathe through nostrils. Have you ever seen a bee with a pair of nostrils? No, they breathe through tiny tubes in their external skeleton. Furthermore, only the original kinds were taken into the ark and not every single species and subspecies and variation alive today. Now you're probably wondering what all of this means, aren't you? Let me explain. Did you know that you and I and every other human being that ever existed have exactly the same scientific name? That name is Homo sapiens, which means wise man. We don't always deserve such a flattering name, do we? Because we often do some really stupid things. Now the two parts of that scientific name is almost like your surname, Homo, and your name, Sapiens. But instead of calling it a surname, we call it the genus. And instead of calling it your name, we call it a species. Likewise, the scientific name of all living organisms consists of two parts, the genus and the species. The lion's surname and name, or genus and species name, is Panthera leo. And that of the leopard is Panthera pardus. Both are classified under the same genus, Panthera. And both, together with all the other cat species and variations, are all classified under the same family, the cat family named Felidae. Then they are further classified into the same order, class and phylum, and eventually under the animal kingdom. But we don't want to go into so much detail. We will only focus on the species, the genus, and the family level of classification. Many species make up a genus, and many genera, this is the plural of genus, make up a family. This is why there are more species than genera, and more genera than families. According to God's word, the original created kinds were created with distinct separate gene pools. Your gene pool is almost like a genetic toolbox that contains an abundance of solutions to help you adapt to possible future environmental challenges. Each original kind consisted of at least two members, a male and a female of the same kind and they could reproduce more of their own kind. One kind, for example a dog kind, cannot reproduce with another kind, a cat kind, to produce fertile offspring. The original cat kind, on the family level of today's classification, contained far more genetic variety than the cat species of today, such as lions, leopards, cheetahs and domestic cats. In other words, the original cat kind had more genetic material and therefore variety in its toolbox. The original elephant kind, on the family level of today's classification, contained enough genetic variety to bring forth all the different element, elephant species, African elephants, Indian elephants, stegodons, mastodons, mammoths. In the same way, all the domestic cattle originated from one original kind, the aurochs. Now what does all of this mean? Well, it shows us that the biblical record, the list of animals in Leviticus, indicates that the original created kinds were not on the species level of today's classification, but probably on the family level, such as the cat family, the elephant family, the dog or wolf family. Now this is supported by scientific evidence which consists of many examples of individuals of different species and sometimes also genera that can produce offspring. In other words, different genera can crossbreed and produce babies which prove to us that they are formed from the same family or original kind. For example, a horse and a donkey can crossbreed to bring forth a mule. This proves that they are descendants of the same original kind. A zonkey is a cross between a zebra and a donkey. A liger is a cross between a lion and a tiger. And a wolfen is a cross between a whale and a dolphin. 
Ligers therefore prove that lions and tigers are different species, but the same kind. Wolfins prove that whales and dolphins are different species, but the same kind. All of these crossbreeds therefore prove that they originated from a specific, originally created kind, respectively. Let's look at dogs as an example. The block at the bottom of the diagram represents the original wolf or dog kind, probably on the family level of today's classification. The upper row represents today's species or genera, which don't naturally breed with each other anymore because of different behavioral patterns or because they live in different regional areas. But strictly speaking, reproduction is still possible between these species since all of their genetic information comes from the same original wolf or dog kind. Today, there are more than 200 types of dogs. This includes the wolves, foxes, jackals and prairie wolves. Together with domestic dogs such as Great Danes and miniature Doberman Pinschers, these all originate from one original dog or wolf kind. And interestingly, researchers recognize that most of the more than 400 breeds of domestic dogs we have today have only arisen in the last 200 years. God created the original created kinds with enough genetic variation to enable them to adapt to the various environmental challenges after the flood. The more variety there was in the original kind's gene pool, in other words, the fuller the toolbox, the greater variety of the same kind eventually emerged. And this explains how the large variety of species today were formed. We call that speciation. But the descendants of fish are still fish, frogs are still frogs, apes are still apes, and humans are still humans, although there are a large variety within each kind. Many people look at the great variety of species today and then they wonder how such a large variety of animals could possibly have fitted into the ark. However, you should now understand that today's species varieties are simply later variations of the original created kinds according to the family level of today's classification that were in Noah's Ark. It should also be clear that the age-old argument about the space problem in the Ark would end if people would stop giving each single animal five different names and then attempt to make it a problem for Noah. And of course, there were dinosaurs in the Ark. Dinosaurs were simply another kind of land animal that breathed air through nostrils and that was created by God together with all the other land animals on day six. Did you know that most dinosaurs weren't even that big at all? Some of them were smaller than chickens. The average size of adult dinosaurs was approximately that of a sheep, some say a bison. Now you mainly envision and see pictures of the giant Tyrannosaurus rex and the enormous Brachiosaurus, especially in books and on TV, is that not so? Now of the 668 so-called dinosaur genera, only 106 of them weighed more than 10 tons when they were adults. The largest egg ever hatched by a dinosaur was only about the size of a football, which means that even the biggest dinosaurs, such as the Apatosaurus and the Brachiosaurus, used to be small, just like you and me. The younger or smaller animals could have easily fitted into the ark. They would have been easier to feed, and they would have had babies sooner after the flood. Let me share some more interesting facts with you. The average median size of all animals on board the ark was probably that of a large size rat. While only 11% of all the animals on the ark were substantially larger than a sheep. This means that most of the animals on board was quite small. Flying reptiles such as the pterodactyls were probably also in the ark, but of course no sea reptiles such as the plesiosaurs. Now we are fooled into believing that 
dinosaurs became extinct 65 million years ago. In other words, a long time before the flood. But Genesis teaches that God made all the land animals on day six, only about 6,000 years ago. And this includes the land-dwelling dinosaurs. And remember, according to God's word, nothing died before Adam and Eve sinned. So, if we choose to believe the word of God in its entirety, then that should be sufficient to distinguish that blinding evolutionary light completely. But I'm guessing that you are still a bit unsure. So let me give you a little bit more information. You can also find more detailed information in chapter 6 of my other book entitled Creation by God or Evolution from Nothing. I repeat, Dinosaurs did not live and die millions of years ago because God completed all of creation in its entirety within six literal days, only about 6,000 years ago. This means that the earth is only about 6,000 years old and that dinosaurs could not have existed millions of years ago since the earth is only about 6,000 years old. Dinosaurs were land animals and they were created on the sixth day together with Adam. This means that Adam was the very first human to see a dinosaur. He must have been extremely excited. Dinosaurs did not evolve into birds, firstly because it is completely impossible, and secondly because the flying creatures such as birds were created one day earlier than the land animals, which included dinosaurs. As with all the other animals in the Garden of Eden, dinosaurs initially only ate plants. Copper engravings dating back to the 1400s can be seen in the Carlisle Cathedral in the UK. And they are so clear that you would easily be able to recognize dinosaurs. Depicted together with animals such as a fish, a dog, a pig, a bird and other familiar animals. How can you draw or engrave something in such detail if you've never seen it before? Remember, the dinosaur fossils were only discovered later in the early 1800s. So it is clear that people knew what dinosaurs looked like because they were alive at the same time, together with other familiar animals. The evolutionist Mary Schweitzer and her team discovered, amongst other things, soft tissue, red blood cells and blood vessels in dinosaur bones. This caused quite a stir in their laboratory and she even admitted that she couldn't believe it until they repeated the experiment 17 times. Why were they so surprised? Well, based on known laws of physics and chemistry, the soft tissue could not have remained intact, soft and stretchy for 65 million years. And it's not just soft tissue, but they also discovered many other things such as proteins and DNA. These are complex molecules that continually break down to simpler molecules. The determined measurable rate of decomposition of certain proteins agrees with an age of about 4,500 years since the flood, but most certainly not with millions of years. Furthermore, carbon-14 has also been detected in dinosaur bones. Now everything that is or that was alive contains carbon. When an organism dies, the amount of carbon-14 within the organism begins to decay radioactively. This simply means that the amount decreases, it becomes less and less and less in a stepwise manner. The less carbon-14 present in the organism, the longer ago it died. When scientists discover carbon-14 in anything, we are always very excited because it provides evidence that supports thousands of years, never millions. Since carbon-14 disappears so quickly, we would not expect to find even a single little carbon-14 atom within a dinosaur skeleton because after about 60,000 years, that's now a theoretical age, only 0.001% or one thousandth, meaning almost nothing, of the original amount will remain. In other words, 
If dinosaurs truly went extinct millions of years ago, not even a single carbon-14 atom should be present in their skeletons. Yet, scientists have discovered carbon-14 in dinosaur bones, which clearly shows that these animals did not die millions of years ago, but only thousands of years ago. You can read more about that in Chapter 8 of my other book. So, how much living space did the animals have? Well, get ready, because here comes a big surprise. If what the majority of scientific evidence confirms is true, that the created kind was on the family level of taxonomic classification, at least with regards to birds and mammals, there would have been only about 2,000 animals in the ark. However, Dr. Wood Murapi, who did the research on this, deliberately decided to make the so-called problem of housing the animals in the ark more challenging by using the genus level of classification instead of the family level, which is far more probable. Remember, there are more species than genera and more genera than families. Hereby, only 16,000 animals or 8,000 pairs would have been in the ark. If the 16,000 animals were in cages, they would have occupied only about 3% of the ark. The other 97% could have been used for food, water and exercise. And here I was thinking they were all crammed up inside like a tin of sardines. Another study was done to determine how long it would have taken those animals to board the ark. It was done by comparing the speed at a butchery where 1,000 pigs per hour was being slaughtered. Naturally, smaller animals move faster than the bigger ones, but at this rate, it would probably have taken about five hours at most for 16,000 animals to board the ark. And this is applicable to a single row, by the way, which was probably not the case because God said, and they went into the ark to Noah two by two. Of course, Noah had neither a fridge nor a freezer on board because those things did not exist yet. If you do not store your food in a fridge or a freezer, it will soon rot. But there are other ways to prevent food from rotting. One of them is to dry the food like we do with fruit and meat when we're making dried fruit and bultong or jerky. Furthermore, dried fruit can easily be compressed so that even more food can be stored in a smaller space. The bulk of various types of fruit and vegetables can be reduced by between 75% and 95% by employing simple procedures such as drying, and especially if it's compressed at the same time. Preservation is actually the correct word used for the various methods that can be used to store food to prevent it from rotting. The pre preservation of food types, including meat and fish, for periods of up to three years has been known ever since ancient biblical times. Leviticus 25 verse 21 to 22 mentions the eating of preserved food. The ancient Romans preserved berries in honey, while various foods such as berries, leaves, root, roots and fresh meat have been preserved for long periods in blubber or oil by the Arctic people. Dried insects are highly nutritious. Indians of the American West used to dry large amounts of grasshoppers, which they then mixed with berries and seeds and nuts, a grasshopper health bar. According to Dr. Wood Murapi, the volume of food needed for Noah, his family and all the animals would have occupied less than 15% of the ark's volume. But most importantly is the fact that God kept his hand over the ark and its inhabitants and we can be sure that he also preserved the food that they had to eat. Right, so we've now spoken about quite a lot of things. Now we can add everything together. We will do a very simple calculation, so don't you run away. We have learned that the animals only needed about 3% of the space on the ark, while the food could have occupied only about 15% of the space. 
If Noah took water on board as well, the water would have probably occupied about 10% of the space on the ark. 3% animals, 15% for food, 10% for water. That equals 28% total used or occupied space. Since we are working with percentages, we have to subtract this amount from 100. So 100 minus 28 equals 72%. This is represented by the green portion of the pie chart. This means that more than 72% of the arc, and possibly even more, was open space. It clearly shows that there was more than enough space for Noah, his family, all the animals, and even the food and the water. There was also a lot of space for playing hide and seek and tag and maybe even a bit of rugby. They could do push-ups and sit-ups and pull-ups and sprints and long distance running and all types of exercises on board. Well, maybe not Noah and his wife, but perhaps their children. This sounds like very good planning to me, don't you think? But why was there so much open space? Who was it for? Well, I believe that God reserved it for the unbelievers who did not heed God's warning, his 120-year-long warning. In this way, God made provision for many, many more people to board the ark than just Noah, his wife, their sons, and their wives. The open space would have been even more if Noah simply used some of the enormous amounts of rainwater rather than storing it inside the ark. Never make the mistake of thinking that the people of ancient times were any less intelligent than we are. That is just another evolutionary idea. In fact, in Genesis 4, it says that Adam and his descendants were grain and livestock farmers. They made musical instruments, they could forge metal and build cities. Shortly after the flood, the Egyptians learned how to write, how to cut granite and how to build the pyramids with great precision, intricate design and fine detail, all without computers. Adam and Eve were created perfect, but since the fall, the mental ability of humans began to decline over a period of 6,000 years. I think Noah would have been clever enough to figure out how to gather rainwater. So let's summarize. Noah and his family were in the ark for exactly one year and 11 days. It is clear that the ark was more than big enough, not only to have the appointed land animals and flying creatures on board, but also to save a lot more people than only eight. Unfortunately, thousands of people refused to heed God's warning. In the next episode on destruction, We'll look at the conditions before and during the flood. See you there.